You're probably familiar with German medium tanks such as the Panzer III and Panzer IV. These vehicles, along with their smaller relatives, the Panzer I and II, made up the bulk of Germany's domestic tanks during the early war period. However, they are not where the story began, with the first German medium project having been under development many years prior to the ones I just mentioned. Today, we will be looking at the interwar design known as the Großtraktor and how it played a role in early German tank development. While many think of the Panzer I as the beginning of German tank design after World War I, this is far from the case. In fact, you would have to travel back to even before the rise of the Nazis to power. In this period, Germany was still in the process of recovering from World War I, and this was especially the case for the military, at that time known as the Reichswehr. Going over the lessons learned from the devastating war, the Reichswehr understood the important role that tanks had created on the battlefield. The ability to break through enemy lines and support infantry while being protected from enemy fire over almost any terrain was undeniably a spectacular development. As with every major army during the time, it was decided that Germany needed its own armored vehicles. However, there was a distinct problem. The Treaty of Versailles forbade Germany from having tanks and even had a penalty for anyone building them including hefty fines or jail time. As you can imagine, this was a very difficult obstacle for the Reichswehr, especially with the potential for invasion due to the occupation of the Rhineland at the time. This is the primary reason that early German tanks have distinctly non-military type names to prevent their true nature from being discovered. Many of you may be familiar with both the Leichtraktor, which has been made popular due to its inclusion in World of Tanks, and the Panzer I, Heinz Guderian's first tank to equip Germany's new Panzer divisions. Though these do both represent designs done under the Treaty of Versailles, the first one to be developed was originally ordered by the Reichswehr in 1925 as the Army Wagen 20. The order was to create what we would now call a medium tank with a fully traversable turret, armored hull, and fully tracked. The tank was to weigh around 15 to 16 tons, have a top speed of 40 kilometers an hour, and have 14 millimeters of armor. The armament was to be multiple machine guns and a 75 millimeter gun placed in the turret. One other requirement was made for this tank, one that you would not really expect when it comes to a medium tank. It was to be amphibious. Contracts would be given to three companies in 1927 that would go on to become fully involved in German tank development, namely Krupp, Rheinmetall, and Daimler-Benz. In 1927, the first design proposal was presented to the Reichswehr by Krupp, which included a 75mm Krupp-designed gun based on a mountain cannon situated in a relatively small two-man turret. In the rear of the tank was a machine gun turret which was able to traverse in order to cover the entire rear area of the vehicle from infantry and aircraft. The hull itself was relatively large with two tracks that were reminiscent of World War I being fully exposed around the two sides of the vehicle. This was the general design chosen by all three companies. Daimler-Benz's design team, headed by Ferdinand Porsche, created an apparently very complex vehicle in comparison to the other two designs when it came to the internals. First off, their design was to use a Daimler-Benz 260 horsepower aircraft engine connected to a clutchless six-speed gearbox that the driver would use a lever on the steering wheel in order to shift. In addition to this, the Daimler design also incorporated a drivetrain that was a complex mix of upside down leaf springs and gears that would drive externally. Eventually, Krupp and Rheinmetall also decided to use an aircraft engine with another strange transmission that used a pneumatic drive. It is not known when exactly the Armeewagen 20 changed names, but in a document from March of 1928, the name Grosstraktor was recorded in a procurement document. By this time, the vehicle's design had been primarily decided on. A 16-ton, two-turreted tank armed with a short-barreled 75mm main gun, a 7.92mm machine gun in the bow of the tank, as well as the main and rear turrets. All of this would ride on 16 road wheels attached to a large, trapezoid-like shaped hull. In regards to the amphibious requirements, the tank had special propellers designed that would be mounted to the rear and driven by two engines. 
The production of the vehicles began on August of 1928 at the Rheinmetall factory in Unterluss. Each of the three companies would have their design built, although the Daimler-Benz design did not include its own turret as they would use the same turret design created by Rheinmetall. It seems Porsche preferred to stick to designing overly complicated hulls while leaving the armament to others as we see this same trend with his later designs. By the end of June 1929, six tanks were completed and shipped to the secret German-Soviet tanker school in Kassen. For those that do not know, during the interwar period before the rise of the Nazis, Germany and the Soviet Union had secret training bases deep in the latter nation's territory. The three that were operational were the Panzerschule Kama, which trained tankers, the Kampfliegerschule Lipetsk, which trained pilots, and the most unique of the three, Gas Teskeland Tomka, which acted as a site to test chemical weapons. From 1929 to 1933, the tanker school in Kama gave both the Reichswehr and German vehicle manufacturers the ability to gain experience in the design and operation of modern armored vehicles. This was the site where many of the tractors were trained on, including the Gross Tractor. Within the first year, the tanks already had an issue that would go on to become part of the legacy of German tanks, their transmissions, drivetrains, and tracks had serious issues that resulted in them traveling at most 66 kilometers in total. Remarkably though, this is still further than the modern British Ajax, which can apparently barely make it out of the factory. In 1931, the tracks and suspensions were modified to better support the vehicle during movement and also prevent the tracks from sliding off due to poor connections. In 1932, the tank also was given brand new coil springs and larger road wheels. At some point, Rheinmetall developed a new turret for one of the vehicles that would have two main guns, a 75mm primary and a 37mm coaxial. By this time, it was found that Rheinmetall's vehicle was the most durable and successful and was able to reach 1,264 kilometers of completed driving by 1933. In addition to standard testing on land, there were also reportedly attempts to see how the tanks fared in their amphibious roles. According to a document posted on the website Tank Archives, there is a statement from Kliment Voryshilov to Stalin about the attempt, which ended in failure. It appears that it went well for the first attempt, going a distance of 5 to 10 meters attached by cable to a tractor. For the second attempt, that safety cable was removed and the vehicle re-entered the water. Things started off fine, but when attempting to make a turn to the right, it started to tilt and caused water to flood the engine and then the crew compartment. Although four of the men were able to escape, the quick sinking led to the death of mechanic Keres who was in the rear compartment. This led to not just a tragic death, but also the temporary loss of the tank until it was able to be towed out later. As you can expect, it was decided that the Gross Tractor would no longer be required to have an amphibious capability. Following the closure of the Kama Tank School, all of the tanks were shipped back to Germany to live out the rest of their lives. As they were essentially obsolete, even by 1933 standards, due to their poor performance and bulky design, the tanks were relegated to training or use as propaganda and monument vehicles. Those that remained in use were given upgrades such as radios and even a new turret. These vehicles were of the Rheinmetall design as Daimler's vehicles were quickly retired and became monuments. In 1935, the first public display of the Gross Traktor in action occurred during maneuvers with the 1st Panzer Division. By this time, many of the problems with the tanks had been addressed, but that did not save them from being relegated back to training units such as the Gunnery School in Putlos. If you think this is where the story of the Gross Traktor comes to an end though, you are mistaken. In fact, the developments made and lessons learned during the development process would be taken into account by Rheinmetall and Krupp to create a tank fit for the ambitions of the newly organized Wehrmacht, a multi-turreted monster that would be reported by Allied agents as Germany's first heavy tank, the Neubefahrzeug, which will be the subject of the next video in this series. Make sure you're subscribed so you won't miss that one. The interwar period saw the creation of many interesting designs for armored vehicles, with all nations attempting to figure out how to create a truly modern tank. This was no different in Germany, but unlike other nations, they were forced to do so in secrecy, making it a bit more difficult to develop vehicles without alerting their neighbors. The Gross Traktor represented the first attempt since World War I to develop a tank, and on paper, it looked to be an impressive vehicle for the late 1920s. 
a large main gun with relatively good armor and the ability to support infantry and cross water hazards sounds like a dream for a World War I commander, but the tank proved to not be as great in practice. Large, complex, and cumbersome, the Gross Traktor did not prove to be a viable design that would spawn a lineage of new tanks for Germany. However, it did prove to give invaluable lessons that would lead to more successful projects such as the Panzer series that we all know. Hopefully you enjoyed this look at one of Germany's earliest tank projects. If you did, be sure to subscribe to the channel so you don't miss the upcoming video on its bigger brother. As always, thank you all for watching and a special thanks to my YouTube members for supporting the channel. If you found this video interesting, I recommend following it with my other videos on early German tank projects like the A7V and the massive K-Wagen. Hope to see you there or in my next video.